Module PHLT, Instructor Lecture, Episode 1, Introduction, Why We Waste. To be wasteful or not to be wasteful, that is the question. To waste or not to waste. Why do we waste? It is a choice, although often not one we are conscious of or want to admit making. We often feel we have no choice because the practice is all around us, embedded in our culture like apple pie and the apple skins and cores and seeds you throw away after you make it. American families used to feed it to their pigs. To my grandmother's generation, living through the scarcity of World War II rationing, waste was more or less an anathema. Food scraps were fed to the hogs and chickens or turned into soil. Animal carcasses and cooking grease were rendered into fats and oils used to make explosives in the war, nitroglycerin. The effort was called bacon to bombs. Scrap metal was gathered and sold to make artillery. Bottles were turned back into bottles. People would darn a sock and patch their clothes. And plastics were still, by and large, a thing of the future. A future we hadn't graduated into yet. Life wasn't paradise, as the war showed only too gruesomely, but the planet was still teeming with life. The oceans resplendent with fish and coral, wildlife abounding in massive and at times seemingly endless forests and grasslands. Coal was being mined and burned, and oil was being pumped and burned at ever-accelerating rates, and the greenhouse effect and climate change were being discussed by scientists and businesses as a clear and present danger on the horizon. But when the war ended and America triumphantly pushed the world into industrial exaltation with the 1950s offering better living through chemistry and the promise of electricity too cheap to meter from the mighty atom, and, and, and when we were teaching our children we'd entered a golden age of prosperity, there came a forced sense of false optimism that twisted our aspirations into the creation of the first culture on planet Earth to invent excuses to waste. I heard it from my uncles and aunts in the 1960s and 70s, our parents' and grandparents' generations. They said, suffered scarcity in the Great Depression and the Great Wars. The hell I'm going to live like that ever again. I'm going to take what I can and live life to the fullest, and I ain't going to look back. The conceit became that if you've made it in life, you could afford to waste. It was a sign of privilege. Only the poor needed to make do with what they had or could afford, endlessly fixing and patching and using and reusing and recycling. For the rising middle class, being able to waste was a badge of success. It went hand in hand with conspicuous consumption. Madison Avenue, New York's madmen of advertising, seized upon it and promoted pride in the creation of a throwaway culture. They created and propagandized the myth of the consumer, a zoological oddity, a species of earthling that defies evolutionary history somewhat triumphantly, on a planet where nature knows no waste. The consumer was said to be a creature with the inalienable right to consume. By definition, and with a little sleight of hand crafted in middle and high school biology class with incomplete and distorted diagrams representing what scientists had called trophic levels in the great chain of being in early models of predator-prey relationships, we who pursued biology later in life had to unlearn all this dangerous pigeonholing and accept instead better models that showed a web of life with many organisms switching niches and roles throughout their life and species histories. But the public bought it. We were the Lion King as a result of capitalist, socialist, communist triumphalism, depending where you were in the overlapping hegemonic spheres dominated by the architects of imperialism's and colonialism's foray into industrialism. We were the top predator the great white shark in an area of white supremacist, I'm sorry, in an era of white supremacist hegemony. And as such, we had no obligations other than to eat the smaller fish and shit out their remains without looking behind us, endlessly swimming on to find our next meal. Waste is all about privilege. In fact, it is the conceit of a rapacious society that doesn't think it has to look at the destruction it leaves behind as its members advance locust-like across the landscape consuming everything in their path. So-called Western civilization, which is really Middle Eastern European in origin, built on failed civilizations that inevitably collapsed, turned their homes into deserts and wastelands, an early form of the insidious psychology of waste, 
and moved on to conquer virgin territories, oblivious to the fact that these new worlds, for them, had long since been occupied and not deflowered, but endlessly reflowered by their own inhabitants, more or less successfully sustainable economies. And that is phenomenologically tied to a misapplication of the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, which says that, quote, the entropy, or state of disorder, of any isolated system always increases. Isolated systems spontaneously evolve towards thermal equilibrium, the state of maximum entropy of the system. More simply put, the entropy of the universe, the ultimate isolated system, only increases and never decreases." End quote. Now, the captains of colonialism and industrialism like to suggest that their economic systems were somehow natural, and by so doing cajoled the populace into believing that their social Darwinist and eugenicist interpretation of natural law allowed for the suffering, the immiseration, and extinction of the losers in the struggle for the survival of the fittest. And when they weren't able to convince people about the biological basis, they turned to poorly conceived ideas from physics. <clears throat> With this mindset, the isolated systems that they created in their new nation states could only increase their own order by decreasing the overall order of the systems they brought within them. The mentality created a concept called waste, which I define very simply as the right thing in the wrong place at the wrong time or in the wrong concentration. Let me state that again. For the purpose of this class and our discussions, we define waste as the right thing in the wrong place at the wrong time or in the wrong concentration. For those who don't look back, there is no conscious awareness of the place or concentration or timing of the release of our consumption or production residuals, and so there's no way to truly appreciate their value. Because our activities, or those of the industrial producer and the domestic consumer, have used energy to disorder materials in a way that makes them less available to us and our immediate concerns, we are told that we have increased the entropy of the system and that somehow natural law makes their losses inevitable. Once we've classified them as waste materials whose entropy precludes their recycling based on our perverse application of shallow economic principles, no effort is made to recover them. But this is a purely human construct. It has nothing to do with nature. The fact that systems tend to run down or degrade naturally, going from higher states of order to lower states of order, does apply to open systems that receive energy from outside. As we will cover more in depth in the zero waste physics modules in this course, the Earth is considered a local negentropic system by biologists because the sun bathes us in terawatts of useful photonic and other electromagnetic energy, while the center of the Earth exudes a constant source of heat and material. Life forms evolved to exploit and manage these influxes of energy from above and below and to make use of all their derivatives so that over time, life was able to become more and more complex, not less. This is negative entropy, or neg entropy. And it occurs because nature, unlike modern hegemonic humans, knows no waste. Here's what Georgescu Rogan tells us is the phenomenological gist of the entropy law as it relates to waste and sustainability in your readings. Quote, the road to understanding what entropy is begins with the primary distinction between available and unavailable energy. This distinction is unmistakably anthropomorphic, more so than any other concept in the natural sciences. Indeed, he says, energy is available or unavailable according to whether or not we humans can use it for our own purposes." End quote. Modern descendants of the Middle Eastern European expansionist societies have been very poor at investing in systems that can recover the energy and materials available after use. But to the little fish behind the great white shark, the crumbs spilling out the sides of the shark's mouth and the feces and piss he excretes have nonetheless always had tremendous value. In truly natural systems, systems where the shark is not in an isolated system like an aquarium tank and thus not in an enclosed environment where the nutrients and microbes would create pathogenic conditions, every production or consumption residual is available and useful. In nature, everything gets recycled back into the healthy reef ecosystem. 
of the modern capitalist systems and their socialist and communist brethren, born of the same misunderstandings of nature, created what Marx and Engels called the metabolic rift between areas of natural capital production and human consumption. They broke the cradle-to-cradle -cradle ecological recycling system and created a moribund cradle-to-grave abomination. Paul Hawkins and Amory and Hunter Lovins put it succinctly, without pulling punches, in their book Natural Capitalism, Creating the Next Industrial Revolutions, which is in our syllabus. They write, quote, Capitalism as practiced is a financially profitable, non-sustainable aberration in human development. What might be called industrial capitalism does not fully conform to its own accounting principles. It liquidates its capital and calls it income. It neglects to assign any value to the largest stocks of capital it employs, the natural resources and living systems, as well as the social and cultural systems that are the basis of human capital." End quote. Now they go on to give a bird's eye view on what capital really is, which you will hear me endlessly repeat in all of our courses until the notion courses through you like a transfusion of healthy blood to give new life to your view of life. Quote, humankind has inherited a 3.8 billion year store of natural capital, they say. At present rates of use and degradation, there will be little left by the end of the next century. This is, that's this century. This is not only a matter of aesthetics and morality, it is of the utmost practical concern to society and all people. Despite reams of press about the state of the environment and rafts of laws attempting to prevent further loss, they say, the stock of natural capital is plummeting and the vital life-giving services that flow from it are critical to our prosperity. They go on, natural capitalism recognizes the critical interdependency between the production and use of human-made capital and the maintenance and supply of natural capital. The traditional definition of capital is accumulated wealth in the form of investments, factories, and equipment." End quote. And here is the part of the reading I would like us to pay the deepest attention to and develop the fondest respect for and commit to our bank of cultural capital. They write, quote, Actually, an economy needs four types of capital to function properly. Human capital, in the form of <clears throat> labor and intelligence, culture, and organization. Financial capital, consisting of cash, investments, and monetary instruments. Manufactured capital, including infrastructure, machines, tools, and factories. Natural capital, made up of resources, living systems, and ecosystem services." End quote. Now you should cogitate on the idea that there are many more forms of capital stock we can identify and accumulate the aforementioned cultural capital being one of them. There's also social capital, and one day we may even distinguish digital capital from financial and manufactured as inorganic beings endowed with artificial intelligence begin to proliferate. But for the purposes of explaining the maintenance of the old pre-robotic, pre-AI, pre-machine learning digital economy, the aforementioned four will do. Hawkins and Lovins continue saying, quote, the industrial system uses the first three forms of capital to transform natural capital into the stuff of our daily lives. Cars, highways, cities, bridges, houses, food, medicine, hospitals, and schools. The fourth form is that living capital that Marx laid at the foundation of the capitalist economy. The forests and fields and seas which our impoverished culture, descended from collapsed civilizations in the past, are now laying waste to with diminishing prospects for regeneration. The antidote, of course, is to close the metabolic rift, to refuse to see refuse as something to refuse, to refuse materials whose entropy has been increased through our activities into new goods, to perform chemical, physical, and biological fusion of decomposed elements back into the kind of orderly patterns we recognize as useful and available. That takes energy. And, on, and in societies based on slavery and fossil fuels, which are always either reluctant or scarce and always messy, will almost always claim it can't be done and isn't worth it. This is merely the cradle-to-grave mentality talking, literally out of its ass, turning everything to shit, and not seeing the true value of shit, thinking that it must be flushed away or buried. And this is a decidedly anti-ecological view that we must defeat. As McDonough and Braungart state in our primary text, quote, Rather than seeing materials as a waste management problem, 
as in the cradle to grave system. Cradle to cradle design is based on the closed loop nutrient cycles of nature in which there is no waste. And just like nature, the cradle to cradle design seeks from the start to create buildings, communities, and systems that generate wholly positive effects on human and environmental health. Not less waste and fewer negative effects, but more positive effects of regeneration, seed growth, plant, product, upcycle, and or seed growth, plant, product, etc., etc. One organism's waste is food for another, and nutrients and energy flow perpetually in closed loop cycles of growth, decay, and rebirth. Waste equals food, end quote. So that is the essence of our philosophy of waste argument. It's so simple. Waste equals food. Food for something. In natural ecology, it's food for all the other fish, for the grasses and the worms and the soil and all the other creatures, great and small. In industrial ecology, it's food for efficient industrial systems whose loops are closed. Every material that results from your consumption is now an input for another system of production. In fact, nothing is consumed. There are no consumers. That's another human fiction of fabrication that keeps us from refabricating. There are only, as futurist Alvin Toffler labeled this in the 1970s, prosumers, beings that endlessly produce, consume, produce, consume, and produce. Where crony capitalism created rifts and broke us apart into divided classes, rich and poor, producer and consumer, capital and labor, right and left, Republican and Democrat, white and black, up and down, in an endless string of binaries, reality is a web, not a chain of life with an implied head and an ass, forcing us to fight our way up the food chain. These fictions have been toxic to the human condition. We can do much, much better. With an improved philosophy, with a more mature and compelling and complex epistemology driving the phenomenology of the so-called waste problem and its supposed relationship to the law of entropy, we should be able to get through this century without too much more collateral damage. And we should be able to put civilization and its discontents firmly on the path to contentment, to the pursuit of happiness through truth and justice and free markets. When you, and I mean you, stop refusing to see refuse as a resource and see it instead as a form of capital that you can accumulate and benefit from, that is the day the hope will start to be rekindled within you. It will be the day that you, for starters, refuse to see food residuals as refuse. The day you no longer tolerate food waste, seeing it instead as food wasted, food for someone or something else, and commit yourself to feeding that something else. Your journey to realistic optimism begins when you refuse to throw out that banana peel or orange rind or chicken bone and instead grind it up and pour it on soil or in a biodigester or in a compost bin or give it to someone who sees its value and can profit from it if you are constrained by your circumstances. That day begins when you refuse to allow any organic residuals to stay within or on any metal or plastic or glass or ceramic containers or wrappings that you have been associated with. All of these materials that we use for packaging and transportation are valuable as food for other industrial processes unless they're contaminated by materials, usually organic, that make them too expensive or labor intensive to use again. China and other Asian and South Asian nations have started to refuse accepting your cruddy, rotting, contaminated garbage. Your journey to sustainable citizenry comes when you refuse to let anything leave your possession or premises that hasn't been thoroughly cleaned, separated, and sorted. It doesn't matter if your local garbage man or garbage woman doesn't know what to do with it or carelessly puts it all together again and contaminates it with other people's thoughtless trash. They will only be course corrected when they see your confidence and optimism and your example and your joyous embrace of the materials others consider trash. When that penetrates their consciousness and creates that paradigm busting paradox that human minds grow from. If you really want to refuse waste, you need to remove the waste bin from your own consciousness. You have to eliminate the place you created in your mind to put things you can't see the value of or use of. You have to throw out the garbage can in your brain that sees some materials and forms of energy as unavailable. It's like a black hole that sucks everything in and obscures it in inky darkness before you can ever spend enough time with it to see the light. When you have no place to put waste conceptually, you certainly can't feel comfortable anymore putting it out into the planet. And when it comes to where to put the stuff you feel you don't have use for or room for, 
I entreat you to try the experiment that I did when I was in graduate school, living in a small apartment in Los Angeles, going to UCLA, studying sustainable development like you are. I made a commitment, which I announced in class, to hang on to everything I brought into my apartment for at least one year at a time. During the three years I lived in that tiny flat in the urban Los Angeles Echo Village, I assiduously sorted and shredded all of my so-called trash and built an in-bathroom bucket-based composting toilet for all my organic residuals, all of the outputs of my body and all my uneaten food residuals and plant and animal parts, including all of my paper, my bills and, and cardboard, a great source of organic carbon. By owning the things I actually did own because I bought them and brought them home, I gave my chance, myself the chance to live with the results of my purchases and consumption patterns and develop an intimate relationship with them. The act of capital accumulation and ownership, recognizing these materials as my private property, paid for by me and for which I was uniquely responsible, I was able to see them in new ways. Each year I would take out the trash just once, carting it over to the local recycling center, selling what I could, the aluminum and other metals, and glass fetched the highest prices, giving them my carefully sorted plastics cleaned and sorted by species into numbers one through seven to make it worth their while to finish the recycling process, which we, thinking only as consumers, disrupt. All of the organics became new life-giving food-growing soil, replacing the scourge of lawn outside my apartment window, growing new trees and shrubs. Nowadays, I've upped the ante, adding biodigesters to my life-tested domestic solution portfolio, getting not just fertilizer, but carbon offsetting free fuel from what you think of as icky waste, and saving all my wrappers and chips bags and containers and plastic bags, seeing every barrel of plastic I don't give away as a barrel of my very own petroleum. In a hundred years, my children could inherit an oil baron's worth of safe carbon sequestered plastic material that the rest of humanity has been carelessly and shamefully and stupidly discarding into the sea. If the price of oil keeps rising, I suspect they could end up rich. Who knows? That's the future. But at least I can feel good knowing that what I bring home won't hurt anyone or anything. Anyway, this is the journey I went on, and it is the logical conclusion that I feel you too will come to once your currently unsustainable philosophy of waste is thrown into the waste bin in your mind and then replaced by the negentropic, cradle-to-cradle -cradle way of seeing the world. Then, based on my experience as a graduate student studying the very same things you are here, I expect you will throw that mental waste bin away and firmly plant your feet on the path to a zero-waste circular economy in which you actively participate every day for the rest of your lives. You'll see it too if you don't already. There's only one place for waste. The past.